1966, I was playing drums with a band called The Voxmen. The Voxmen and The Palace Pages were rival bands in San Diego. Both groups played at Arts Roaring Twenties in Il Cajon, California. I heard that The Palace Pages had changed their band name to The Iron Butterfly. With their new name in hand, The Iron Butterfly left San Diego and went to Hollywood to make it. Upon hearing the news that they were headed to LA, I said to the Voxman, if they can do it, so can we. I got $500 from the sale of my car, a little red NSU Prince. I drove my Vespa scooter to Hollywood with my buddy Dave on the back. Dave weighed 200 pounds, which made the drive to LA a real experience. We had to take the Pacific Coast Highway the whole way, because scooters were not allowed on the freeway. When we arrived in Hollywood, the Voxman got a gig at the Sea Witch on Sunset Boulevard. We were paid $17 a night. We're talking $17 a night for the whole band. The Iron Butterfly was playing at Beto Lido's, previously known as Cosmo Alley. I went by to see them, they asked me to sit in. After the first song, they turned around and said, We want you in Iron Butterfly. I said, I can't, I'm loyal to the Voxman. After pleading with me night after night, we decided that we would switch drummers. Their drummer, Jack Penny, liked the Voxman better, so we switched. I was now the drummer of the Iron Butterfly. Iron Butterfly played five sets a night, six nights a week for $125 for the whole band. We lived upstairs in the office area, on the roof, and the women's bathroom of Beto Lito's. We slept on floors. During the day, we would go downstairs to the cellar and rehearse and work on writing new songs. Playing five sets a night, six days a week for seven consecutive weeks, really made the band tight. One night while performing at Beto Lido, Elmer Valentine came down from the whiskey to check us out. Elmer was the founder of three famous nightclubs in Hollywood. The Whiskey, the Roxy Theater, and the Rainbow Bar and Grill. Elmer wanted to see how we would be received. That was all it took. We left Beto Lido's and went to the Whiskey for 30 straight days as the opening house band. We opened for all of the big name acts that played there until the Whiskey was closed for remodeling. From the Whiskey, we went two doors up to the Galaxy Club on Sunset. We played there for three months. The whole band, including Doug Engel, Danny Weiss, Daryl DeLoach, Jerry Penrod, and myself, lived in Laurel Canyon off Kirkwood Drive on Walnut Drive. Jim Morrison of the Doors lived next door. I was making pizzas at the Galaxy to help support the band. Everyone was coming to see us play. During the day, we played for various high schools and did concerts in the San Fernando Valley. The band was signed with Atco Atlantic Records through Green and Stone Management. Our first album, Heavy, was finished. It was recorded at Gold Star Recording Studios in Hollywood. At the end of the Galaxy gig, the band broke up. Danny Weiss left the band. The rest of the band quit soon after he quit. Now the band was just Doug Ingle and myself. Next song is Night Butterfly Original. We call it gentle as it may seem. Atco Atlantic shelved the heavy album because there was no band to support it. Doug and I had to start looking for a guitarist and a bass player. We held auditions at the Magic Mushroom on Ventura Boulevard right across from Richie Portolor's American Studios, where we eventually recorded Metamorphosis. We started auditions. We must have auditioned around 50 musicians. I ran into an old friend in Hollywood, Lee Dorman from San Diego. Lee played drums, but had taken up the bass guitar instead. Lee and I started hanging out. We gave him a chance at an audition. After about two months of auditioning, 
we chose Rick Davis, a young 17-year-old guitar player. He showed up for the audition with a Vox AC100 Super Beetle amp, a Ventures model Mosrite guitar, all of the pedals and effects, a Fender reverb, an Echoplex, and a fuzz face. We couldn't believe that he had the exact setup that Danny had. Rick had bought all of Danny's gear, I mean everything. He even bought Danny's clothes. What he lacked in experience and feel, he made up for in his attitude and musical knowledge. We said, okay, let's give him a try. He was young and ready to work hard. We rented a house in Mission Hills where Doug, Lee, and I lived. Rick was still attending Reseda High School and living with his mom. We set up our equipment in the living room to rehearse and write songs. Rick decided to change his name to Eric Braun. He thought it sounded better than his real name. I picked him up after school on my Vespa scooter and took him with me to rehearsals every day. We had to get the consent of Eric's mother to join the band. Doug's original version of Vita was written as a slow country ballad. It was about one and a half minutes long. I came home late one night. Doug had been drinking. He had consumed a whole gallon of Red Mountain wine. I asked him what he had done. He was playing a slow ballad on his Vox keyboard. It was hard to understand Doug because he was so drunk. I wrote down what I thought he was saying on a napkin. I wrote exactly how it sounded phonetically. It sounded like Inagata de Vida. It was supposed to be In the Garden of Eden. About a year later, and with the new band lineup, now with Lee Dorman on bass and Eric Brown on guitar, we took Vida to rehearsals and started to actually put the song together as a band. After many months of opening for the Jefferson Airplane, the song got longer and longer. It literally took on a life of its own. Immediately after the tour with the Jefferson Airplane, we went into Ultrasonic Studios and recorded Ina Gada Da Vida in one take. The engineer, Don Castle, said, come in and listen. We overdubbed Doug's tracking scratch vocal and Eric's lead guitar. Vida was done, 17 minutes and five seconds long. In a God of a Vida, honey, don't you know that I'm loving you? In a God of a Vida, baby, don't you know that I'll always be true? The songs for the Ball album were written at the Mission Hills rented oh, house various rehearsal studios, and while we were on the road. The album was recorded at the Hit Factory Studios in New York with engineer-producer Jim Hilton. After recording the Ball album, along with a whole lot of touring, we needed a break. At this time, there were major differences in the musical direction of the band. Eric was not on board with the rest of us, ultimately causing his departure from the band. We replaced Eric with Mike Panera and Larry Rhino Reinhardt. Mike Panera was previously in the blues image of Ride Captain Ride fame. Rhino was playing with a band called The Second Coming, which was comprised of Dickie Betts on guitar, Barry Oakley on bass, John Meeks on drums, whom later joined the Allman Brothers. We began writing songs and rehearsing for the album Metamorphosis at Doug Ingalls' home in Calabasas. The rest was rehearsed and recorded in two weeks at American Studios on Ventura Boulevard with Richie Podolor and Bill Cooper. American Studios was the first to have an all-DC studio running on car batteries, meaning there was no AC hum. The studio was converted from an old Chinese restaurant. It had a walk-in refrigerator, which was an amazing live chamber. Metamorphosis is my favorite album. My favorite songs are Soldier and Slower Than Guns. 
we got to spread our wings and be totally creative. The whole Metamorphosis album is a very special trip. It was released in August of 1970. Improvisation is always good. We were especially playing off of each other. I loved it. To me, our music is more of a metaphysical statement, backtracking a little soul experience and unconscious power were inspired by a LSD trip. I only took it once. In the time of our lives is also a look at life. My favorite and most memorable of all the places we played was the Newport Pop Festival, August 3rd and 4th, 1968, and the Royal Albert Hall, January 8th, 1971. We were playing Friday, Saturday, and Sunday in San Francisco at the Fillmore. We did two sets a night. When we got off stage in San Francisco, we got two hours sleep. The next morning, we flew to LAX, picked up a limo, and drove to the Newport Festival. We had to use someone else's instruments. We played an hour and a half set to 100,000 people as far as the eye could see. On stage, it was a real rush. After the gig at Newport, it was back to LAX, then to San Francisco. We rested again for two hours, played two more sets, and then went back home. We still loved the smaller, more personal venues where we can see, feel, and talk to the fans. Ringo Starr and Paul McCartney came to see us at the Albert Hall. Ringo took me out to dinner and drinks and said, I hope you don't mind I stole a part of your drum solo in Vita. I told him not at all. I took it as a compliment. 